my boy Joshua Ezzy. Mic check, mic check. Can you turn me up a little bit more? We good? Okay, thanks, bro. Appreciate it. How's everybody doing this evening? That's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. Who's that very first time on Unplugged this evening? Let's give it up for our first time guest. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. Also, let's give it up for the, like I always say, the best DJ this side of glory. Let's get up for DJ T. We good, David? I appreciate it, appreciate it. We let everybody come on in. Yeah, so we're basically for those who are brand new to Unplug. We're in the middle of our World War Me series talking about the world, the war, and our place in it. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about the truth about God. And for the next couple of weeks or so, I'm going to stay uh, on the topic of God because I want to cover some attributes that I think that we as a body of people should, uh, or just people, period, need to understand about this character uh, or, or about God's character. So today we're going to talk about God's holiness. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, 14 through 17. <laughs> Let me check. And also with uh, Unplug, we, we integrate social media with our discussions. So if you hear anything that resonates, you can't hear me? Oh, microphone? All right, appreciate it. Mic check. Oh, there we go. Appreciate you, fellas. First Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. And like I said before, if you hear anything that resonates with you that you think your friends and family on Facebook or Twitter needs to know, definitely utilize the hashtag, the truth about God. So if you hear anything, definitely utilize that hashtag. You can follow me on my Twitter handles up there at MyCoachJosh, or you can follow me on or Unplug on Twitter at UnpluggedCLT. And bear with me, I'm just getting over a cold, but I'm going to preach anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> First Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity for me to, to give this honor to speak on behalf of you. Lord, I am consciously aware of other brothers and sisters in other parts of this world that are not able to do what I'm doing today. <clears throat> Lord, I am also consciously aware of my brothers and sisters who's are, who are being persecuted in Iraq, and I pray for their strength as you continue to protect them. So right now, Father God, as I say that I'm grateful that in this country in America, we have the opportunity these few days to be able to come together and talk about you. And Father God, I pray as I talk about your holiness and I talk about your character and who you are, I pray your heart becomes my heart. And what you want to be said will be said. Lord, I know, Father God, this can be a tough message, but I know, Father God, that it needs to be heard. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. Holiness is the perfection of God's character meaning that God is without flaw or without sin. The beautiful thing about God's holiness is that even though his holiness hates sin, his holiness still wants to help the sinner. His holiness, his character is so complete, is so perfect, that before he even created the world, that he's, his character was already established. This God is not a God whose character is developing. <clears throat> this God is not a God whose personality is being developed. He, he is who he is. Contrary to popular belief, people believe that this God is so holy that he cannot be touched by man. No, God's holiness, even though it hates sin, it still wants to be engaging with this creation. Many of us lose sight of the importance of God's attribute when it comes to his holiness. The Bible says, be ye holy for I am holy. Holiness by definition means to be set apart, meaning that there's a difference. If you look at your life today, are you making decisions based upon the character of God's holiness? Are you making decisions today based upon his, his heart for you to be set apart from those things that we entangle with every day? I know it's tough in this world, a lot of influences, a lot of distractions, but until we understand this pure attribute of God's wholeness and what it means, then it could change the course of our life. Let's look at this text for a minute. Verse 14 says, as obedient children, 
Do not be conformed to the passion of your former ignorance. In order for me to be one with this God, for me to understand his holiness, I have to ask myself, am I obedient to him? See, obedience, many times we look at obedience based upon, well, I'm just going to obey God for my benefit. Obedience should be based upon I'm obeying without objection. That just because since I know that God is all knowing, all powerful, everywhere, since this God is this God who is supreme, then I should obey without objection. Sometimes in our life, we want to obey if it benefits us. But it's, it's something about us desiring to be holy with God, to be set apart for him. Now, in holiness, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be perfect like him. There's, no, there's a distinction between us two. But what he's calling for us to be is said, I want to call you from among these people and be with me. Are we obedient today? If God tells you to go left, are you going to listen? If God was to tell you to move, will you listen? If God was to tell you to let go of that man, let go of that woman, would you listen? If God was to tell you, do you trust his omniscience? Do you trust that he's all-knowing? Do you trust that even if he tells you to go left, that you know that he's supreme in knowledge, knowing that if he tells you to go, that he knows what's best for you? Do you trust that he's everywhere, that even when you feel like you're being stripped from your family, stripped from your friends, that when you make that decision to follow God, he's going to be there? Do you trust that even if he tells you to let go of that person, let go of that job, let go of the opportunity, you know that he's all-powerful enough? that no matter where he tells you to go, that you'll be obedient like children without objection. Peter's trying to tell these people, be obedient as dear children without objection, because if you're not, that you will have these passions that will lead you to your former self. The Bible says, any man or any woman that be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away and behold, all things become new. What does that mean? It's not saying that you're past because we are becoming new. What he's saying is that you, from you being born through Adam, that sin nature that's in you, that you're no longer having that chromosome of your father, that sin nature in you, that you actually have something born inside of you that's going to help you and enable you to be a better person so that when you are this new creature, that you don't have to go to your former passions. Let's look at the difference between pure passion and polluted passion. If I want to be set apart for his use, see, ladies and gentlemen, before I can be set apart, before I can be set, or before I am sent out, I have to be set apart. What does that mean? Many of us want to be sent out. Hey, yo, God, man, send me out there to that city. I want to take this city, Lord. You know, I want to I go travel the world. I want to, God, send me out there. I want to do great things for you. But God said, before I send you, I got to draw you to myself. It's like a bow and arrow. Before you shoot an arrow, the arrow is drawn closer to the person before they shoot it out. And many of us look at life based upon, you know what, God, I think that I'm okay. I think that I'm willing. I think that I have the ability. I think I have all the things that I need to do what you've called me to do. But God said, I don't care about your abilities externally. I care about your soul internally. Are we willing to obey God to the point to where we look at our passion? Look at, let's look at the word passion. The Bible says, if you if be obedient as dear children, that you will follow the path, that you won't, that you... But she distracted me. It's all good. What does scripture say? As obedient children, do not conform, do not be conformed to the passion of your former ignorance. Pure passion and polluted passion. There's nothing wrong with having passion. I think God wants us to do great things in his life. God's in, a, God's in a stickler type God that says, man, you know what, you got you to gotta get every A's, all A's in school, you got to dot every I cross every T, you got to be this perfected individual before I can use you. <clears throat> but what he's saying is, is that if you're not careful, if you do not listen to every word that I say, if you don't seek my word in a, in a, in, in so deeply and so richly to the point to where you begin to apply it to your life, if you avoid these different things that you should be doing in your life, then you'll go back to your former passions. My passions in my past. That I fight with today. I want to be successful, Sherry. Sometimes I look at my life, I said, I want to be a millionaire. I want to be a billionaire, Mike. I want to be successful. But if I'm not obedient to God, sometimes I can get myself caught up in my former self. How many of us wrestle with the person we used to be? How many of us are wrestling with the person that we're trying to fight against? See, I don't got time to compare my life to you, Mike. I can't compare my life to you, my brother here, Chris. I can't compare my life to you. I got to compare myself with the person I was yesterday because progression is not based upon how more successful I am than you. Progression is, am I a better me today? If we're not obedient to God, we'll find ourselves in our former self. 
We'll find ourselves where our passions begin to get polluted and our passions begin to get so, so engulfed in this, this culture to the point to where, you know what, I want to be like my old self because being our old self was very comfortable. Being holy is tough. Being set apart is tough. And holiness is not sitting there saying perfection. God's not looking for perfection because he already perfected for you to be walking into his perfection of grace that will sanctify you into that coming day. What he is saying is that I want you to be set apart that when people look at you, they cannot see that you're a part of the world. Darkness can't light up darkness. And many of us have the audacity to think that we're clean. Many of us have the audacity to think that we're okay. And many of us should shut down our ministries today. Many of us should stop singing. Many of us should stop doing the things that we're doing today because we're doing it with unclean hands. And many of us have the audacity to still do the work on God, do the work for God with unclean hands. When are we going to get to a place where we recognize how holy this God is and say, God, I want to be set apart for you. I'd rather shut this thing down before I do anything else with this ministry with unclean hands. Is that your heart? Are you a person that says, I will be willing to stop everything that I'm doing now? Because if many of us look at what we're building, these monuments that we're building, if we take three or four steps away of what we're building, we're building a monument to ourselves, thinking that we're building it for God. When we do things knowing that God is holy, that's not meant to scare us. That's not meant, God's not sitting there saying, you can't come to me. He said, no, I want to engage with you, but I can't engage with a prostitute. I can't engage with an adulterer. I can't engage with a person that loves somebody else more than me. Ladies and gentlemen, I would not marry a woman who wants somebody else over me. I cannot engage with something that wants something else more than wants me. Because when I begin to engage with something that wants something more than me, I lose. And God is sick and tired. He is sick and tired of people saying that I will do this in Jesus' name and I do this for him and I do great things. God, you think that you're going to get glory with God because you do great things because the applause of the people. God's looking at you and saying, I don't know you. Are you allowing your polluted passions because of disobedience lead you to your former self? When you get entangled with who you used to be, you cannot be who God intended for you to be. If I'm still caught up in, see, look, man, I got to look at my life every day. And this, this message convicted me 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning when I was working on it. Because I got to ask myself, am I a better Josh than I was a year ago? Am I a better Josh than I am today? How much of God's holiness is before my face every day? How much in me, how much of me is so engulfed in who he is that I'm willing to say, God, every decision I make for you is for you. And many of us... If we search our hearts deeply, we're still entangled with our former selves. That we miss out on the opportunity to the future hope that we have. Let's keep going. As obedient children, obeying God because I know he knows everything and I know he's all powerful and I know that he's able to do whatever I need for his will. The text says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former self. That Peter's trying to warn us that, man, in this life, when you walk with God, you're going to be tempted to be like who you used to be. But if you keep God in your form, if you keep God in the forefront of your mind, it will keep you from making some of the mistakes that we make every day. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it's written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Let's look at that. The significance of being called. Many of us lost sight that God has called us. And if you haven't been called today, we have an opportunity to pray for you. There's significance when I know that an omniscient being called me, Chris. Called gives me significant in work. That meaning that while he was busy... <laughs> while he was worrying about what's going on in the Gaza Strip or Iraq, that he knows me by name. God's not such a God that's so holy that he says, you know what, you got to get clean before you come to me. No, he says, I will engage with you so that when I come, I can clean you. <clears throat> I'm thankful that I can serve a God that's so holy, so set apart, but yet engaging. That God's not sitting there saying that if I touch you, I'll be like you. He is so perfect in character that no matter how he walks amongst us or how he entangles or engages with us, that he doesn't have to become unpure, that while I'm engaging with him, I become holy. And many of us have to ask ourselves, am I being set apart or am I being set amongst? Am I being set apart for his use or am I set and entangling myself with those things that's keeping me from being who I need to be? Sin 
will keep you from helping yourself. Sin will keep you from helping others. And sin will keep you from being a help to God. And what happens is Satan loves through the satanic system to get us so caught up in life, get so caught up in what we want, get us so caught up in our former passions to the point where we get ourselves entangled with these women, these men, these concepts, these ideologies, these temptations, these drugs, that we get so entangled that we are no help to God. Now, I'm not trying to sit there and say that God needs us. God don't need us. God is so self-sufficient, self-reliant. God don't need If God needed us, he would have sent one of us to die on the cross. <laughs> he didn't need us. If he needed us, he would have sent one of us out there. But he said, I will come myself to prove to you what true love is, that when I die for your sins, you will understand what true love is. That's why he said, look, if you don't obey my words, man, if you don't take time to engage with me, then your passions will dwell up inside of you because there's no Holy Spirit. Well, you, you grieve him to the point to where when he tries to tell you not to go left or not to go right, you are too numb and too deaf to hear him. So when you start going to disobedience, your former passions are going to develop. When your former passions are going to develop, you become your former self. And you lose sight that the one who called you said that you are so significant so worthy. I don't care what your past is. This holy God says, I want to get to know you. This God who says, I am so different from you. My ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are so higher than your thoughts, DJT, that even though I'm this high of a God, that whenever you need wisdom, I'm there. Whenever you need love, I'm there. Whenever you need joy, whenever you need peace, I'm there. But we want these external blessings without asking God for the internal ones, the ones that's going to help us to sustain those things that he wants to give us. He's holy. When are we going to let these sins down? Like I said, many of us should have been quit half the stuff we do for God because we're doing it with unclean hands. And all those people who's watching online and everyone who's watching right now, you have to ask yourself, am I building God's monuments? Am I building his kingdom with unwashed hands? I got to look in my heart and say, God, is my heart, is it, a, is it a contract one? Is it a heart of flesh? Is it a heart that wants to be what you want? Do I hunger and thirst after righteousness? Do I hunger and thirst for my own selfishness? I have to ask myself, who is the number one and the center focus of every aspect of my life? Because one day God's holiness will equal his wrath. And those people who didn't take the time with air in their lungs to acknowledge his holiness while his grace and mercy blocked his wrath, once that moment grace and mercy is set away, all wrath will be laid on every single person who did not take the time to acknowledge how holy this God is. And I refuse to think that I'm okay. There's a difference between thinking I'm okay, Sherry and Jonathan, than knowing that I'm okay. There's this difference, I, I think I'm saved. Oh, that's a dangerous place to be. I gotta ask myself, do I know that I'm changed? Not that I know that I've confessed. It's not about did I confess one day. No, am I a different person? Am I changed? All of us will have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with God. I'd rather see his wholeness connected with such with the beauty of his grace and the significance of his mercy, that as I have these altars here and I can go to my prayer closet there and I can humble myself before God and say, God, use me. But before you use me, God, save me. There's a significance about being called, ladies and gentlemen. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy. In all your conduct. You notice the word all. Every one of us have the opportunity to be poised, to be patient when it comes to making decisions. That before I make a decision, I ask myself, is all of what I'm about to do, or basically let me say it like this, every decision I make, I got to make sure I have God in mind. You want to stop stumbling? Before you make a decision, keep God in mind. Be like, okay, God, what would Jesus do? I know it's 1990s when no bracelets came out, but we have to ask ourselves, is that bracelet not just on our wrist, but is that bracelet on our heart? What would Jesus do in this moment? It would save many of our consequences. Let's keep going. Let's talk about the process of holiness. Give me about 10 minutes. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the process of holiness. Like I said, <clears throat> Before God sends you out, he sets you apart. I'll say it again. Before God sends you out, he sets you apart. Before Abraham was a father of many nations, he set him apart from his family. 
his fathers, his kinfolk. Before David was king of Israel, God set him apart and put him in the wilderness with the Philistine. Before, who else? Before Joseph was second in command of Egypt, God had to set him apart away from his family, set him into a pit, set him in prison before he was second in command. Before Jesus was even who he was in Jerusalem, before who he was on the cross, he had to be set apart into the wilderness. Before we are sent out, because God only understands this, how you market determines your results. God's not going to sit there and put fake people out to market him if he knows they're not going to be used by him. See, anybody can go out there and be marketed by God. And many of us get, get upset when God, or not God, or when everyone gets thrown out there and everyone's doing great things for God, and we get judged because why God using them? God may not have been sending them. So we get so caught up on the people who's out there on TV, out there on radio, out there doing their, get, doing their thing, but we're like, man, God, why you got me here? No, God says, I don't, I see, I don't put things out there to market me falsely. And so what he says is, before I send you out, I got to set you apart. God does these three things. He sets you apart, he sits you still, and he sends you out. He sets you apart, he sits you still, and then he sends you out. Let's look at set apart. This process of holiness is a process. Just like salvation is a process that I'm justified in him, that I'm saved by grace, no works, but my works prove that I was saved by grace. Sanctification means that he's purifying me in this life that as I'm in the salvation process that he's actually making me new to the point that when I become glorified where he says, you know what, you're time to die, it's time to go up to heaven. Then now I'm glorified, I'm like, I'm, I'm like him, not equal to him as God, but I've got my new body, etc. This process of holiness is important for us to understand because if we don't understand this, then we'll not be able to do exploits like God says in his word that we should do. He says greater things you would do. But you can't do these greater things with still junk inside of you. Set apart is dangerous. It gets, it's nerve-wracking to us because, because set apart means that he's setting a distinction. That he's setting a distinction between me and my former self, distinction between me and others, and distinction between me and my idols. And what happens is we fight this resistance. We fight this setting apartness. We fight this, this process of holiness because we don't want to be alone. All these people were left alone. Before God puts you amongst the crowd, he sits you alone. We don't want to be alone. But God says, you never alone. I'm everywhere. And the beauty about God is that when he is setting me apart, he's letting me see the potential in me. He's letting me see that you thought you was doing good out there. You thought you was okay when you was a, a, a part of those crews and part of those people and part of those ideologies or concepts of mine that you thought you was okay because you was one with them. But he says, I want to make you detach from them and one with me. Are you willing to be set apart as men? It's tough to be set apart. To not sleep around, that's a distinction. To be poised and patient, that's a distinction. To be God-fearing, that's a distinction. Ladies, to keep yourself, to, that's a distinction. To not gossip, that's a distinction. To not be whatever the world defines womanhood or manhood to be, that's a distinction. And we've been so engulfed in this culture for so long, engulfed in this situation so long, DJT, to the point to where we become one of what our culture is. But we get so caught up in a culture that's beneath what God wants us to be in, and he says, I want you to be a part of a culture that's more kingdom-minded than earthly-minded, a culture that's so caught up in how it was intended to be than what it is now. And many of us fight this being set apart for so hard, for so long, that we want to be amongst the crowd. We want to be amongst the people. We want to be sent out now. But God says, if I don't set you apart, how can I clean you? It reminds me of a pot of clay. A potter goes and sets apart a piece of clay to himself. Sits the clay still. You notice that he don't put two pots together. No, he focuses on one pot. As he's working on the clay, Two hands are at work. 
He has one hand in the clay to make it hollow and one hand to shape it. God has one hand in you cleaning you out, the other hand shaping you. And what happens is we resist the hand of God getting all the junk out of us because God wants empty, clean vessels. Before, he can, before God can use me on Thursday, I have to ask myself, God, am I a clean vessel? Am I a vessel that is clean for you to dwell in? And what happens is the power or the level or the weight of the anointing that flows through me is based upon how empty and clean I am for him to dwell in. And what happens is we become non-effective, non-useful, because we have so much junk in this clay to the point where the clay is cracking, things are leaking, and God cannot use you because we're too holy, as in holes, than holy. And we get so caught up on God, I don't want to be set apart. But God said, okay, you don't want to be set apart. You will not be used by me. And as he has one hand inside of you, pulling all that unnecessarily mud out, the other hand is shaping you. Before God sends you out, he sets you apart. He makes a distinction between you and your former self, a distinction between you and others, and a distinction between you and your idols. Then he sits you still. We hate being still. When I work at the Wild Man, <clears throat> when I was a manager, even now to this day sometime, I go back there in the, uh, the youth center. Back when I was a manager, I used to play ping pong all the time with the kids. It got so boring up there in the front, I go down and play ping pong with the kids. And, and, and mind you, never let kids win, man. Like this girl came in uh, Tuesday. She played me a year ago and still remembers when I let her beat her, let her beat me. And I was like, man, dang, I never let a kid beat you. But anyway, when you put a kid in timeout, when they're in a room with all these PlayStations and all these Wii's, their environment begins to pull them from being still. So what happens is since they're in this room with all these distractions, it's hard for them to sit still because they're still connected to what they want to do. In life, God does the same thing. It's so hard for us to be still because we see all these distractions. So God sets us apart from all the distractions so that when we get amongst the distractions, those distractions won't have us. And what happens is many of us are not effective with God because we're so entangled about where is my Boaz, where is my wife, where is my job, where is my money. We get so caught up on them, but where is God? Do you not know you have everything with God? He owned a cattle on a thousand hills. Man, that, that's a metaphor saying that, that our God is rich. Our God is rich in anything that you need. I don't got to worry about a car. I don't have to worry about children or wife. I don't have to worry about careers. I don't have to worry about this ministry because I know it's in his hands. And all he wants me to do now is to sit still and know that he is God. Until we recognize how, I think we don't know how good this God is. I don't think that we trust him enough. Man, yo, man, God is still sustaining this world on let there be. God is not, you, God is not worried about nothing. I don't care what's going on with the Ebola. I don't care what's going on with the ISIS groups. I don't care about what's going on in our world. God is not worried. All this is a part of his plan. And what he's asking for you and ourselves is don't worry about the job, don't worry about the money, don't worry about the baby, don't worry about nothing. Be still. What's gonna happen when they start dropping bombs in America? What's gonna happen when they start wrapping around us with nets, taking our rights as Christians? What's gonna happen when we find ourselves in compromised situations where we're gonna be people that's so caught up that I don't wanna take, I'll take the chip, give me the chip, give me whatever you need so I can keep my life. Do you not know God? It doesn't matter. I don't care how many people getting beheaded over there. If it's not my time to go, it's not my time to go. Are you willing to be so still in God that you trust it? If it's my time to go, I'll be like, Stephen, you throw stones, I won't feel it. Do we trust him enough to say, God, I will be still no matter what? Because the being still means that he's developing my patience. Patience is essential. Patience it's necessary. In this world, I gotta come from a heart because what's coming to America is pretty bad and you have to have patience. Yeah, yeah. You remember Elijah? He fed that man at a brook. Sent him raving, sent him a meat eater bird, meat eating bird to feed him. Are we willing to trust God that God can bring us big mats from a bird? That God can feed us at a brook? But the reason why Elijah got fed because he listened. He was obedient. And many of us find ourselves in those concentration camps, find ourselves in these little different lines, demand to connect ourselves to the government so deep that the government becomes your God. But are you willing to say, God, I know that my life rests in your hands, that if, I, if it's meant for me to die today, I trust you. Because absent from the body 
is present with the Lord. We want to be absent from the body and be present in our life. That's what we really want. But are we willing to say, God, it doesn't matter what your life is. I will be obedient to you. I will not allow my polluted passions to compare, conform me to my former self. And I'll be so caught up in you that you called me that I will be holy like you are holy. Because when God sets you apart, he sets you still like a pot. After he cleans the inside and shapes the outside, he then puts it in the furnace. What happens when everything gets hot around you? God gets quiet when it gets hot. When they put the clay pot in the oven, it gets the impurities out. We don't like to be holy because we don't like to be hot. We don't like to be holy because we don't like to let go of these impurities. Because we actually, if we're honest, between me and you, Chris, between us, we like our sin. We like them. No, no, better yet, we love them. So when God puts you in that wilderness that all of us have to go through, are you willing to be still and let those impurities come out? Because I don't want to be a person with, with, with a heart that's undealt with. Yes, I'm I don't want to be out here and embarrass the God that called me. This holy God, man, listen, man. These last four months, was God telling me you was going the wrong way? I decided to follow my own self, man. I love God, man. I love him. Don't think I was out here tripping. But as human beings, we get so caught up in ourselves. How can I get more people in this room through concerts, gimmicks, and poetry? How can I make my name great? I can be honest with you. How can I get more Twitter followers? How can I get more likes? I'm tired of these preachers getting ahead of me. I'm better than them. I'm tired of not getting no preaching again. This is how, how I was thinking last year. <clears throat> God, I'm tired of suffering. I'm tired of going through things. But he took my idol away and said, Josh, until you get to the fundamentals, you will not be able to stand in front of thousands. You can't kneel before one. You won't be able to travel the world until you kneel before one. He told me, until you get on your knees and pray and seek me because I am holy. I don't want wherever I preach to be unholy ground. I don't want angels to be like, he's not with us, and they fly away. I want wherever I go, angels, the host of angels, and this place would be holy ground. That I take my shoes off. Because what I'm stepping in is holy ground. Because I'm holy, not perfect, but God, I made sure that I'm setting my, I'm let you set me apart from everybody. Set me apart, sit me still, shut this ministry down if you have to, because I refuse. Do you have that heart? Because ladies and gentlemen, one day we're going to meet this holy God. And I don't want you to stand before him, Sherry. I don't want you to stand before him. I don't want you to, no, I don't want y'all, no, y'all standing over there and sit there and be like, man, man, I'm not ready. God, no, clean me, man. As Caesar Praise comes up and the fellas move these, um, these props, I want you to take some time to think about your life. I don't think I covered everything, but I think I covered what I was supposed to. Before you write another book, before you write another song, before you do the next thing for God, ask yourself, is your heart ready? Did you see that you got the song? Appreciate it.